But the other thing that we try to cover in these broadcasts is what's happening with technology. And that's why we have uh, uh, Mr. Robert George from Brillowin Energy talking to us because it's technology that is also disrupting our lives. We see a familiar pattern with history, but that pattern can be broken in a very disruptive way when we have certain types of technology coming in. And just to give you an idea of what's going on, he sent us a Defense Intelligence Agency analysis, an unclassified analysis a couple of years ago of uh, where LENR is, low energy nuclear reactions. And what they said was, this is the uh, DIA, they said it can produce uh, nuclear origin energy at room temperatures. And this disruptive technology could revolutionize energy production and storage since nuclear reactions release millions of times more energy per unit mass than any other known chemical fuel. For example, and they give this in their uh, closing argument, they say nuclear fusion releases 10 million times more energy per unit mass than does liquid transportation fuel. In other words, gasoline or jet fuel or something like that. And they say, because this is the uh, U.S. government and the military looking at this, since the U.S. military is the largest user of liquid fuel for transportation, Leonard Power Sources could produce the greatest transformation of the battlefield for U.S. forces since the transition from horsepower to gasoline power. So this is an incredibly transforming technology if it comes true. I want to talk to uh, Mr. George about the history of this because it's something we've seen uh, talked about for quite some time. Thank you for joining us, uh, Robert George. Thank you for having me. Let's talk a little bit about the history here because a lot of people have heard about uh, coal fusion, and I guess we could say it's kind of become the uh, Rodney Dangerfield of, uh, of physics. It gets no respect, okay? Uh, because Absolutely. when it first came out in 1989, you had this chemical reaction. They didn't know what was happening with it. There was some unexplained effects. So the big issue was, was it chemical or was it nuclear? They had no theory to explain it. So they basically uh, have been having this argument for quite some time. Give us a little bit of the uh, history of this so people understand uh, how this has developed over the last uh, 30, so, 30 some odd years and where we are today. Absolutely. The, when Pons and Fleischmann first introduced it, uh, in 89, uh, it, <clears throat> the Department of Energy was about to release $800 million <clears throat> for fusion energy research. And they decided to hold it up um, because cold fusion, which was a misnomer at the time, was introduced. And they said, well, you need to investigate this uh, before we release the money to find out if, it, if it's legitimate. And the ones they asked to evaluate it were MIT and Caltech and uh, Texas A&M. Uh, to verify or invalidate the technology. And uh, they these all, people were hot fusion uh, advocates, so they had different they, technologies, competing technologies that they wanted to go out and get the money for. They, they did. They, mm -hmm. they were all hot fusion physicists that uh, were waiting for their budgets to be approved. <clears throat> MIT um, uh, was one of the, the, the universities that discredited it, um, they got caught later for downshifting the data because they did see excess heat. And uh, it was uh, there was a lawsuit resulting in their uh, falsification of the information, and they lost, but they don't bring that to the fore. Um, to so the, when we're talking about hot fusion versus cold fusion and going back again, you know, 30-some-odd years ago, uh, we're talking about fusion with cold fusion, fusion occurring at room temperature versus massive amounts of energy having to be put in with hot fusion, which is, has not worked yet because they haven't been able to get something that has a net uh, increase in production of energy. They, they basically can't recoup what they have to put in it to get it hot. So you're talking about a situation that uh, where fusion is occurring at room temperature is what people are looking at, or now they're calling it a low energy nuclear reaction. What has happened in the intervening years that show that it's not just excess heat, but there's other things that have come out that let them give a hint that uh, uh, there's really fusion going on here? Well, since 1989, there have been scientists all over the world that have been testing and working on, on this phenomenon. Uh, the most recent ones, uh, the NASA, the Spar Wars group uh, down in San Diego, <clears throat> they got uh, 30 times excess heat out of their unit. Hmm. Uh, uh, energetics technology that came out of uh, Israel and is now at the University of Missouri. They also were verified at getting 30 times excess heat. Uh, most of the people that were discrediting the field were saying, well, it's a hybrid chemical reaction. And, um, you know, the proof was, was lacking to verify that this was actually a nuclear reaction. And uh, we've taken samples out of our boiler 
and sent it down to Los Alamos and had a scientist down there verify that uh, it actually is a nuclear reaction. And mm -hmm. unlike uh, the uranium nuclear reactions, <clears throat> there are no uh, hazardous byproducts. The byproducts of exciting hydrogen, which is the fuel, uh, is basically heat and helium. And we've had uh, Silicon Valley scientists from some of the major companies here in the Valley, as well as the uh, people from the Naval Research Lab in Washington come out with their radiation detectors to, to verify if there's any harmful radiation coming from our system. So and, what, what uh, you're looking at is essentially, you're looking at the transmutation of hydrogen with a end product of helium. And so because you have that, uh, that process where it goes from deuterium to tritium, you, you can, that only happens if it's a nuclear reaction that's going on there. And then that tritium that, quickly decays into a helium byproduct, which is not a dangerous thing going on there. But they can see two things. They can see nuclear activities going on. They can see that there's a transmutation of elements, which shows that there is something going on there that is nuclear. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that the, the tritium is basically part of the fuel cycle. And uh, if you're generating excess heat, then you don't build up the amount of tritium in the system. And uh, in fact, that's how we met the scientists down in Los Alamos. They had looked at our website and looked at our PowerPoint and, and our patents and, and basically were trying to replicate it. <clears throat> and they were getting tritium, but they weren't getting excess heat. Mm -hmm. And they asked well, what they were doing wrong. And, and our chief scientist and the, the inventor and founder, Robert Goddess, basically went through the process they were using and showed him how to get excess heat out of the process. Now, we're talking about the excess heat, and of course, uh, that, that's a key thing for power generation. I mean, most of, um, you know, we look at a nuclear power plant, and as uh, Einstein said, or, or one of the nuclear physicists said, that's a, a heck of a way to boil water. But I mean, that's the way you generate power, right? You create, uh, you, you burn... Uh, uh, some kind of a fossil fuel, or you burn wood, or you create a nuclear reaction, and then that creates heat that then creates steam and drives turbines and so forth and so on. That's the way you generate uh, power. So when we're looking at uh, creation of heat, that's a very important thing. You're talking about uh, a, a piece of equipment that had, say, uh, 30 times uh, increase in heat. It seems to me whether or not that is fusion or not, that would be something somebody would want to... Uh, continue with as a technology and develop that. It, it, to me, it doesn't really matter whether it's chemical or whether it is a, a fusion or a nuclear reaction. Uh, I would still want to try to uh, en enhance that and, and uh, make that work. Well, since the university's discredited it uh, since 89, uh, it's been uh, political suicide or academic suicide to even work on it in, in universities. Um, most in the last three years, we've tried to get the uh, national labs to do uh, material analysis for us and isotopic analysis on our cores uh, just to verify uh, what the systems are actually occurring in, in there. We're willing to pay them for it. And their response has been, this is too controversial. We can't work on it. <laughs> That's amazing. But, you know, this is not something that we haven't seen in other fields as well. You have vested interests, whether it's in drugs or whether it's in particular types of food or whether it's in energy. You have the vested interests that are there, and they don't want to run the studies to show that some alternative would be cheaper, more uh, economical, more environmentally friendly. They essentially shut that down, and not only do they not fund it, but they demonize it, they ridicule it, they do everything they can to uh, censor it. And, and that's essentially what we're seeing here with low-energy nuclear reactions, isn't it? Yes, this could actually shift us off a lot of the petroleum usage. Uh, from cars to airplanes uh, to diesel trucks and buses. Uh, this could be very dramatic. We have two products currently, one that would be suitable for home heating, which operates at about uh, 80 degrees to 80, 150 degrees C, or domestic hot water. And then we have another one that's a gas phase system that operates at 600 degrees C that's suitable for generating electricity and could repower coal power, power, power plants. And so those are the systems. That's, that's where you are right now in terms of, of your state of the art. So you've got essentially something that could replace a water heater as well as something else that could uh, generate electricity. And, and what are the inputs to your systems? Basically, the thing that's been missing from the field all these years is a control system. There have been scientists all over the world that are getting this excess heat, as I mentioned earlier, the Spot Wars people, the NASA people. Uh, the problem has been uh, being able to start the reaction uh, when you want it to and be able to start it, stop it when you need to. And uh, 
uh, Robert Gottes developed, is an electrical engineer, a multidiscipline engineer, and developed a, a control system we call the Q-Pulse that actually, uh, if for the home heating system, for example, when you turn up your thermostat, you want the heat to come on immediately. Mm -hmm. And so our reaction starts immediately. And it, when you turn off the Q-Pulse, it immediately stops. So there's no chance of the system running away. And, and if it runs away, it just it's just hot water, so it doesn't really matter. So is this something we're likely to see uh, sometime in the uh, in the near future? I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, Mr. Fusion machine like we saw in the uh, DeLorean and Back to the Future. Are, are we going to be are we going to see this in a nice uh, uh, containerized thing, or are you still trying to uh, uh, get financial backing to do this and trying to fight the uh, censorship and the uh, prejudice in the scientific community against this to to get this uh, developed? All of the, all of the above. Yeah. We've raised about uh, $13 million over the last 10 years uh, to develop the systems. We have a system operating under scientists down at SRI International because of the controversy in the field. We wanted independent scientists verifying our results in our system uh, hands off from us, and uh, that's been going very well. Uh, and as a result of our work, although we've had very little interest in the United States, uh, the Defense uh, Authorization Act has just recently added LENR to uh, their bill. But we've licensed uh, a South Korean firm, a manufacturer, a uh, multi-million dollar license to start manufacturing and distributing it in South Korea. We have a license in Canada as well. Um, but there's been very little interest or support in the United States. And this is where we need it the most. And, you know, quite frankly, I, I think a lot of that is, is due to politics. I mean, we look at how deeply embedded uh, the oil business is in terms of the banking business. You know, we've got the petrodollar that was created as they took us off the gold standard. They created a fiat currency with cooperation of Saudi Arabia. And it's having the ability to print that money without anything behind it and then use that as the... Uh, uh, the medium of exchange for all the oil that has really been uh, the bedrock of our financial system here in America is a petrodollar. So there has to be a tremendous amount of political pressure not to do that. And yet, on the other hand, this is such a disruptive technology, and there's every other country essentially is working with this. We've got uh, this uh, document that you gave me that is uh, six years old from the Defense Intelligence uh, Agency. They point out how it's Japan and Italy are, are uh, pretty far along in research, but of course, China, Russia, India, all these uh, countries, uh, fr France as well, they all have their own uh, research projects. So in that sense, you have to move forward with uh, doing the research or you get left behind. Yes, we've been very fortunate to have angel investors that have, have come in and are supporting the, the company. Uh, the technology is disruptive, as you said, uh, and uh, the carbon-based industry is so well entrenched that it's difficult for them to uh, look at this kind of technology as something that's going to be useful or necessary. Mm -hmm. um, most people confuse what we're doing uh, <clears throat> with the hydrogen and water is using it as a, a fuel, as a combustible fuel, but hydrogen as a nuclear fuel has uh, so much higher energy density. As an example, uh, if you take the volume of water contained in the in the area of a number three pencil eraser and just take the hydrogen out of that volume of water, it's equivalent to two 38-gallon barrels of gasoline. That's the energy density that we're talking about. Wow. So, so the boiler that we have de developed for the home heating system, which is a two-liter vessel, has one liter of water in it with electrolyte. And that amount of water is capable of heating your home for, for 10 or 15 years. Wow, that is amazing. And, and of course, that, that's an idea of just how disruptive this is. That, that gores a lot of people's uh, cash cows when you do it something does. like that. <laughs> it's, uh, it would be, be a very freeing technology. Heard. And we, we seem to have a history in this country of technologies that, uh, that free us, technologies that are clean uh, being shut down. And, and that's the, the amazing thing about this. It, it really is. And uh, this will be the first time you could have a home heating system that you could actually calculate your return on investment because all you'll need is electricity to stimulate the reaction. Let me let me get some idea about how far away you are with this. Now, this is uh, is this something that, um, you, you know, you have a working model uh, that, that you've got here. You're looking for investors to try to uh, market this. Is, is that what the, uh, the issue is here? You've already got... Uh, uh, some set uh, products. You've got the, um, uh, what was it called, the wet, um, 
the wet, wet boiler, boiler as well as a hydrogen hot tube. Those are the two products that you had just described earlier. I mean, are those ready to go to market? And we'll take no, your answer uh, wh when you come back. We've got to go to a break, and we're going to be right back. We're talking to Robert George. He's with Brillowin Energy Corporation, and it's a company that is looking at low energy nuclear reactions. And they have a couple of systems here, as he pointed out, just a, a little bit of water power your house for years, okay? This is amazingly disruptive technology. If we don't do it in America, somebody else will, but there's a lot of political resistance. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. We're talking to a gentleman with Brillowin Energy Corporation about uh, his company's efforts to create cold fusion, as it's been known in the past, but as they're referring to it today, low energy nuclear reactions. Before we get back to him, I just want to remind you that our specials that we've had since the 28-hour uh, marathon sale that we had last week, we've had three specials that we've extended uh, through this week. Those are going to be ending this weekend because we're going to be running out of stock. It's been very successful. We really appreciate your support on this. It's vital for us as well as uh, a way that we can fund our operation without being uh, dependent on big companies who uh, would shut us down with the types of things we talk about. I mean, we're talking about a very disruptive technology here. We talk about very disruptive politics here. And uh, that's why it's important for us to self-fund our operations, it's why we appreciate your support, and it's why we offer these kinds of sales and appreciation. And so we've extended this 40% off on Brain Force, 30% off on Vitamin Mineral Fusion, and 30% off DNA Force. That is our very expensive, difficult-to-produce uh, formulation that has BioPQQ. You can look that up. There's 175 clinical studies that talk about how effective BioPQQ is. You can look at the reviews for all these products as well as everything that we sell at InfoWarsStore.com. See what other people say that uh, their experiences have been with that. And, of course, because DNA Force is so difficult to produce, so expensive to produce, that 30% savings is a huge discount. So take advantage of that now as well as the 30% off Vitamin Mineral Fusion drink mix and the 40% off Brain Force. And we have store-wide free shipping that we have extended as well as a thank you to you to help you uh, take advantage of this to provide for your health, your family's health, and to fund our operation. Thank you so much for your support. You'll find that all at InfoWarsStore.com. I want to go back to uh, Mr. Robert George with Brillowin uh, Energy. You know, Mr. George, when I'm looking at things like uh, the, the issues that we've been seeing with Tesla, they just had their uh, corporate sales come out. They have been in operation for 13 years. Uh, they have lost money every quarter except one. <laughs> That's not really a, a good record. And yet their stock has multiplied by a factor of 12. They keep passing this on. They're under investigation by the SEC at the current time. But nevertheless, I see these large corporations like Tesla, like Uber, because Uber is going to be part of the disruptive technologies that are going to uh, hand over control of our transportation to the government where they can uh, tax and track us. It'll also uh, make it uh, difficult for us to uh, afford transportation. So when we look at things that line up with the political agenda of the establishment, we see these people kind of get everything the, 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 the way is, is cleared for them. Uh, Wall Street helps them. The government helps them to uh, take down obstacles. And yet, when we look at something like this that is very disruptive, as you were saying in the last uh, segment, what was it, uh, uh, some water that's about the size of a pencil combined with your device would power your home's energy needs for about 10 or 15 years? That's an amazingly uh, transformative and freeing technology. Uh, it, it, it's, but it's difficult for you to uh, uh, get this out into the marketplace because Wall Street has some vested interests in the existing energy infrastructures, don't they? Absolutely. When we took it to Wall Street, uh, they looked at the upside potential of this kind of technology and said it's worth trillions. You're only trying to raise 15 to $20 million. It makes no sense. We can't do that. <laughs> got to go big. Yeah, well, that's certainly what we've seen with Uber and Tesla. you you got to be uh, you got to be out there and, and kind of brash, I guess, to get their attention. But you also have to be politically connected. Uh, maybe you should uh, do some crowdsourcing or take this on Shark Tank or something like that. Uh, we certainly wish you luck with this. And uh, thank you so much for talking to us about it. Uh, we hope that this is going to be something that is going to uh, free us with technology because too often... We see technology being used to suppress our freedoms. This is something that would have a, a very freeing effect, I believe. That's it for today's broadcast. Uh, join us tonight at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.